Welcome to the Ideal Investor Show. This is the podcast where we help you challenge your mindset and discover where you are. Tired of stories about other people's success? We can help you change your life, determine your time freedom point and join us on the journey to financial success. Let's go. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show, where we talk to interesting people around money, investing, cash flow, reaching the time freedom point, financial independence and passive income. And today we have another awesome guest with us. Eric Simonson is with us. He is from Abando and he will tell us a little bit how financial planning can be done in a different way. Welcome to the show, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Axel. It's great. Great to be here. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we want to thank you for your time. And and maybe before we dive into exactly what you're doing, how did you even get into the financial industry and up where you are today? Oh, yeah, great question. So I've uh, been in the industry for looking at the calendar uh, 16 years now. And I originally got into it right out of college um, because I was looking for a career that uh, I was able to really make a, a large impact in people's lives. Okay. And, you know, I didn't, I just didn't want a regular office job. I, I wanted to do something where I really felt like I was making a difference. And um, I, I just fortunately landed a, an internship in a financial planning practice. And I saw that, yeah, I was able to uh, really impact people's lives. I was able to have good, you know, good work-life balance. I was able to check a lot of the boxes I was looking for. And I decided to make that my career. Okay, yeah, that's wonderful. And when you say impact, in which way? Can you go a little deeper and what kind of impact? Yeah, I mean, I I think it just the recommendations that we give can reverberate across, you know, f- families and generations, right? If if we do a something something as simple as say, hey, you should increase your 401k contributions because you're a little bit behind on retirement. I mean, that's a simple that's a simple ask and that's also a simple change for, for some people. And, you know, the impact that has compounding over their lifetime is huge. And so it means a better retirement. It potentially means money left over when they die for their children, um, all sorts of things. Right. And it, and that's just one example across, you know, 40, 50 different things that we talk about in each meeting with clients. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you for explaining that. So when we go to a bundle, what what's different? What is Abando all about? And and how did you transition from I don't know, like what was probably more of a traditional um, financial services organization to your own? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I started for the first twelve years of my career as a traditional kind of financial advisor, financial planner. Um, and really, why I made the transition is because I, I realized that you know, most financial advisors have a a minimum requirement to work with you. You know, if you don't have $500,000 or you don't have a million dollars, they they just don't want to work with you because they're not going to make the revenue that they they want to target per customer. And I never, you know, I never really kind of liked that because I felt like there were so, so many Americans, there's so many people out there that didn't have that kind of wealth that still needed good advice. And so I was looking for a way to, you know, how can I charge in a way that I can still serve these people? Um, and you know, that coupled with the fact that I also saw all around me kind of the rise of low cost investing, um, through Vanguard, through Fidelity, just, you know, offering lower and lower expense, uh, ratio investments, you know, I thought, wow, that, that's something I would love to be able to help my clients invest in as well. And so, you know, those two ideas married into this, um, this new business that I started in 2019, where, um, you know, we don't charge investment fees. We don't charge, you know, we don't have commissions. We don't sell products. All we do is give, uh, you know, honest, good advice for a low monthly uh, fee and anybody, you know, anybody who can afford that fee gets, gets advice. Um, and we're trying to basically serve, serve the underserved and serve people who don't traditionally um, have access to an advisor or, or necessarily want to work with a traditional advisor. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And I can imagine that that is much more appealing to a much broader number of people. So are there any kind of starting criteria where you would say, okay, when would it even make sense to have an advisor um, and maybe separating investing from money management? Yeah, I think um, the common perception is people view 
you know, they, they view the idea of hiring a financial advisor as one that they make when they have wealth. Um, and, you know, I would really, really chat and say that the best time to hire a financial planner, a good financial planner, um, is as soon as you get your first real job, right? Because um, what we do is we help we help our clients make benefits decisions. So choosing the right benefits through work, how much to save into the 401k, what medical plan to choose, you know, should, should they choose the HSA option? How much should they put in the HSA? Should they do the Roth 401k or pre-tax 401k? How to set up their first budget, how to pay down student loan debt, you know, all these things that are very important to do, even if you have, you know, $0 uh, basically invested uh, at that point, um, because those decisions and that foundation that you set to begin, you know, has again, that compounding effect over your lifetime. And it's so powerful. Okay. Yeah. I think that makes sense to our audience and anybody can relate, um, you know, that the sooner we were starting, I mean, i I still find it tragic that there isn't like school classes that, right. Yeah. You know, how, to, how to manage your money, how to handle your money, what is compounding interest and not even to say, okay, it has to be in this kind of like it should be stocks or it should be real estate or it should be commodities or anything, even anywhere into that. But the fundamental things that you even, I mean, kind of always tell this little anecdote that um, my wife and I, many years ago, we went to a store and they had a sale where you could buy a big bag of rice or they had the typical little packages in the shelves, right? And um, the store also had which was one of the early ones where you could buy stuff loose, right? Like, so these big bags were oftentimes mm -hmm. felt into, and then you could get like anything from like a quarter pound to, I don't know, 10 pounds or stuff. So, but they had these big bags and they said, if you buy the whole bag, you get 10% off. And we thought, well, we're using quite a bit at the time. We take one. It was organic brown rice, all the good stuff. Go to the cash register and the girl scans it, sees the price. I look at it and said, yeah, but that's the normal price. We need to get the, I say to her, right? We need to get the 252 off that the sign said. And she said, well, I don't know anything about it. So I go and bring the sign that says 10% off. And she says, yeah. mm, okay, let me get a calculator. And then she scrambled through the whole store to find a little calculator so she could figure out that it was 252. <laughs> yeah, just to <laughs> move, basically move the decimal, right? Yeah, but the point that she, and, and I don't want to you know, say this is typical, but it, it, I have run across so many people who have a hard time doing 10 or 15 or 20% of anything, right? Yeah. And when you say, okay, I want to have people being taught compounding interest in school, <laughs> maybe that's asking a little much sometimes, you know? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm with you. I wish that there was just more, more of that basic education around the, yeah, the power of, of starting early, um, how to, you know, how to, how to set up a budget, how to, how to identify good debt versus bad debt. I mean, there's just so much, so much stuff to learn. Yeah, and there yeah, are no really education. weird, really weird cultural things, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I know this from my family and I know this is being practiced to this day that oftentimes the kids, even when they're in their teens, don't know what's happening with money in the family. Yeah. They might absolutely. know that it's either tight or it's abundant, or if they yell loud enough or get too annoying or annoying enough, then they get what they want. But any kind of how is that working and where is it coming from or so forth is almost like culturally kept away from the kids. Kind of, we don't want to, get them involved in our problems, which I think is actually exactly the opposite. If they were involved in the family's issues, as far as keeping um, a budget, like you just said, or any of those kind of things, it would be probably much better and, and trigger cu curiosity that could be then filled basically with information. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. So um, when we thinking about this advice, I mean, you, you said it could basically ideally start um, as early as possible, but what is realistically your experience when people start coming to you? Yeah, we've got, you know, our youngest client is 19. Um, you know, we, we have a number of clients in their early twenties. Um, I would say though, if we looked at an average across, um, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of folks that we've helped, um, it's, 
probably early 30s, early to mid 30s, like 33, 34 um, would be, you know, usually it's that, uh, you know, they're a, a couple or, you know, a person who's starting to make decent money, you know, within their career. And now maybe they have a kid and they're looking at buying either first or second home. And there's just more decisions that they're trying to manage on their own that they, they want to get help with. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. And that's kind of what I thought um, would be probably the answer. Now, one thing that I've been hopping on lately, especially because the media is putting, I would call it data into our um, consciousness without really doing much more than it just being data. So the thing that I believe is really completely underserved from explaining those data points is purchasing power. So, you know, since we rarely have an, a financial advisor expert person who is actually dealing with these kind of things, could you help maybe have a conversation about what's been happening with purchasing power and how that is influencing going forward for somebody who is saying, okay, I don't want to work like my parents until I'm 65 or 70. But I keep saying, you know, purchasing power is a big decision driver in this whole aspect of what do you do with the money that you don't need to pay for your life, standard life expenses. Yeah. When you when you when you say purchasing power, do you mean um, just the impact that inflation has had over the past couple of years? And, and rising interest rates and how that's changed things or yeah, that's one part right like i mean it's pretty easy to say since before the pandemic like in 2019 or very like first january 2020 till now it's probably fair to say that across the board we lost somewhere in the 20 plus percent yes area of purchasing power just how much do i get for a hundred dollars basically but then yeah I also yeah. i also feel um if you combine that, for example, with the fact that the stock market is not back from where it was in 2021 and, and yeah. one that people, for example, hopefully, I hope that our advice and our podcast helps people to realize or helped at the time to realize it's a good time to get my mortgage for my property when it was two and a half and three percent versus now. Yeah. Right. So these yeah. things are all kind of combined and, and flow together, especially when you have a little bit of a longer term perspective. So yes, to your point, I mean, that is all, all accurate. I think it is, it's almost shocking how, how much has changed financially in the past couple of years. I mean, the average cost of a home has gone up on its own, right? That just the yeah. purchase price. But then when you combine that with the fact that a mortgage now is at 7%, um, your monthly payment for the same house is more than double what right. it was in 20, you know, 2019, 2020. Um, and that's substantial. I mean, that's thousands of dollars a month of potential cash flow outlay. Um, add to that the fact that um dining, you know, grocery costs, dining out costs are have gone up more than inflation. Uh, more than the, you know, the the core inflation number you hear. Travel costs have gone up more than the core inflation number that you hear. I mean, there's um the I would say the real spending that people are kind of used to in their lives has gone up so much and incomes haven't kept pace with that. I mean, incomes have gone up, right. but they've gone up maybe five or 10% over the past two or three years versus everything else has gone up 20, 30% on average. So yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's kind of disheartening that I have, you know, we have so many clients that are doing such good things, but they're, they're still like, gosh, it's so hard right now. It's so hard to save. It's so hard to, you know, continue to make headway just because they're trying to you know, they're trying to buy milk and they're trying to just live their life and, and do what they've always done. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you look at this, I totally agree with what you just mentioned. And I think on top of that, if people were in the area that we recommend for them to be in, meaning real estate investing, then they would have done actually pretty well because both the prices, as you mentioned, of the houses have increased. So they have obviously quite a bit of equity that has built. Not because we tell them to sell, but you know, if you just look at it, it's basically value that has yep. increased. But also rents have gone up because yep. they're also part of inflation and quite a bit. So that means the income side or the cash flow side has improved. If I compare that to somebody like and we have clients who we help to actually overcome that situation who bought stocks like just before the pandemic or like after that real deep dip when everybody said, Okay, now we have this kind of V-shaped recovery into 2021 and you look at where they are right now 
So it feels almost like, I don't know how long it's going to take, but the last three years were basically rather a loss if you invested significantly in stocks, except for a super picker who picks just a few that were really good, but the vast majority weren't. Um, and I just recently saw a, a little clip from Ray Dalio where he basically in a commercial type thing was saying, what people always forget is if you're, uh, investment goes down by 30%, it has to go back up by 60%. Or if it goes down by 50%, it has to go up by 100% just to get even. Right. right. Yeah. So with that in mind, where do you see the opportunity, if at all, to kind of make up what's been going on? You just said, you know, like it's gotten very different between like, let's say, end of 2019 and today. In many ways, I think it has gotten more complex, but what what advice do you give to people if they want to basically still not work till 70 or some, something like that? Yeah, uh, you're absolutely correct. Real estate has done better in the last few years than other other areas. Um, you know, the, the con only concern I have with real estate is, is the insurance side of things and just how that landscape is really changing with, um, with the cost of insuring homes and then the, you know, potential insurability of them. Um, that's just such a changing landscape right now. But, um, you know, the, the areas that I would say I, I find interesting right now are, um, you know, I'm hearing more and more about um, kind of guaranteed rates, guaranteed products at 7%. I mean, there's, there's CDs now that are paying 7%. Um, money market accounts are paying over 5%. Um, you know, I think you, right, knowing, understanding real estate, when you look at a good, you know, kind of good ROI on investment, like, yeah, 5 to 7% is not quite what you're targeting, but you're starting to get close and it's risk-free. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in, in seeing where those go. And then the other thing is, um, you know, there's been, for for the average investor who who does have money in, in their 401k or, or wherever, you know, there's a chance that uh, or there's a good chance that a, a portion of it is in bonds. Um, right. And bonds have been really, really beaten up over the past year and a half as the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates to, to fight inflation. Um, but the interesting thing now is, you know, bonds are pretty well positioned where if if the Federal Reserve stop, you know, and they're starting to slow down the rate hikes, but if they stop them or if they even start cutting rates to maybe stimulate economy, if we, if we have a recession, you know, bonds are going to be probably your best performing asset class uh, in your portfolio. And so I think that right now they're down and out, but uh, you know, don't, that doesn't mean that, you know, put everything in stocks because I think bonds are, are going to have their day again pretty soon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, I think, one of the big lessons that is very hard to invest uh, counter cyclical, basically, right, to say, go after the stuff that nobody wants, when yeah. nobody wants it, and don't, and, and basically sell it when everybody is getting giddy and <laughs> wanting to get into it. Um, one of the things you mentioned, um, you know, planning for retirement and, and starting early so that there's more time and, and ultimately a, a larger amount. I'm really curious because I'm sure that you're looking at this whole picture all the time. Based from my perspective on this ever increasing debt across all kinds of places, but we, we have this little fun, funny debt clock for the national debt. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what cities are doing, what pension funds are doing, what, um, you know, like all kinds of different areas, of community, if you want to call it that, incurring additional debt to pay for stuff or, or you know, like, for example, right now we're giving $7,500 to everybody who wants to buy an electric car. And I'm a huge Tesla fan, but I'm not really sure that we are in a position where we should do that, especially because it doesn't look like the car companies can't figure it out by themselves. But what I'm getting at and what my question is, is, why would I then even go in anything that is restricted, you know, where I can only do certain investments? I, if I want to take my money out, I have to pay a fee or a fine or uh, I'm losing stuff and I can't really borrow against and so forth. Why not just basically work with somebody like Eric Simonson and Abando and just do it directly and I can do anything and everything I want to within the market without some 
program that tells me limitations for some maybe never appearing benefit. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the reason you would, you would invest in a plan that has restrictions like a 401k IRA Roth IRA um, is because, well, one with the 401k you're, it's, you're hopefully to take advantage of free money from your employer. So, you know, if they're offering you a, a, a match, if they say, Hey, you put in 6%, we'll put in 3%. That's free money. I would say I would I would have a hard time not taking that. Um, so one, it's it's to get that, and then there are, you know, within those types of plans, um, there are those tax status tax tax benefits that, yes, you know, they're they're they exist. Uh, they're not guaranteed, right? They 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 always in forty years they could flip the script and change them, yeah. but they haven't yet since they've, you know, since they've been around, like they haven't changed Roth status from being tax-free to now not being tax-free. Um, and, you know, I get asked that question a lot, like, well, Eric, what, what about if they change the rules? And I don't, obviously, I don't know what will happen. I don't have a crystal ball, but the precedent is if they change the rules, usually it's going to be grandfathered in, you know, if, if your account was tax deferred, uh, or your account was tax-free, and they change the rules, it's probably going to still be tax-free up until that date. And so I still think there's an argument to, you know, don't go, don't put everything in restricted accounts, but at least be smart about maximizing company contributions. And then, you know, the, the, the tax benefits you can get um, it, with today's laws. Okay. So cool. Yeah. I'm thinking, you know, you and I could maybe add a little supplemental advisory where we just teach people how to negotiate with their employer like yeah get more i'm get very more very dollars. convinced i mean and this nowadays and this might change obviously we had times with high employment and very low unemployment like right now i think it's probably as low as it's ever been or very close to it we obviously had other times in the past but i really feel if you have an employer who says okay i'm matching X amount, which in nominal numbers is a certain amount of money that we are basically putting into this plan. And when you say, well, I don't want you to put it in the plan, I want you to give it to me as additional income so I can invest it myself. And they say, no, I would say to anybody who works with me, that's probably not the employer you want to work for for a very long time. Because fundamentally for them, it's an expense or an additional salary position anyway, however they declare it, right? Mm -hmm. But from, from your freedom to do with the money that you make to say, okay, we give $500 a month for somebody as a match into their retirement plan, but we're not going to give it to you if it doesn't go into the same plan. I would say it's not the employer I want to work for or you should work for. At the same time, I think what's really missing is not their willingness. I think it's missing that nobody, like I, I maybe you open a little side side gig so to speak to say hey i also teach you how to negotiate your employment contract that allows you to get access to this money without having to put it in a restricted plan and then you come to me eric and i tell you what to do with the money all of it not just the part that you use out of your income yeah i think that i think there are some companies there actually there's a fair amount of companies that do do that um the the big reason why most don't um and you, you know, you can argue for or against it, but it, it's, it's to try to encourage people to save because the fear is if you give them that money, people aren't going to be as responsible as Axel and they're not going to be as responsible as me. And there's a risk that they just go spend it. Right. And then they didn't, you know, they don't actually, um, save it in a, in a right way. They don't use it for real estate. They don't deposit it into other investments. And so it's, it's the idea is to encourage people by, right. you know, by could controlling it more yeah, yeah absolutely i'm totally with you except for one little thing one What's little that? thing and i hope you would agree if they were really honestly that concerned about employees like you and me potentially or anybody who's working for them then they would have kept the employer pension system or the employer retirement system oh 100 percent right? right because yeah. i mean th there was a time when you yeah. work for big companies like ford or something like that and they did that for you exactly yep. for the reason that you said they wanted to make sure that when you worked for them for 20 or 30 years and then you retire, the company would pay 
you an additional pension in addition to your social security. So that yes. totally always made sense to me to say, we don't know if you will really responsibly keep that money. So we have a system, it's gonna be taken out of your income, it goes into the pot. And when you actually finished working, we wanna honor the fact that you work for us by paying your basically a Ford or a GM or whatever fill in the blanks company pension. They were the ones who wanted to get rid of it. So I, I'm a little cynical maybe to say, I really believe that they are having their employees best interest in mind because if they were really uh, uh, thinking that we don't take care of it in the right way, then they should take care of it, but they don't do that anymore. <laughs> I No, I 100,000% agree with you, but it's the story they tell us, right? So um, if somebody says, wow, this kind of monthly thing and really kind of getting a plan together, I think you guys call it an action plan and see what I can do and maybe what I should change. What should people do? How they how do they get a uh, hold of you, Eric? Yeah, if they want to uh, learn more about what we're doing here at Abundo, they can check out our website, which is uh, abundowealth.com, A-B-U-N-D-O, wealth.com. Um, on there, we've got a... a a number of different links to schedule a free consultation with us. So you can meet with one of our financial planners. Uh, they can learn more about you, kind of what your goals are, what you're hoping to accomplish, uh, share more about how we work. And then if, uh, if it's a good fit, we're off and running. Um, we are, we work with clients all across the country. We have clients in, I think, 36 States now. Okay, um, good. so, so we are entirely virtual. Um, and yeah, you can also find us on social media, um, at Abundant Wealth uh, and all the different social media platforms. Yeah, that's very cool. And I actually went to the website so website, and I looked around. It's really easy to navigate. It has a lot of good information. So I can only advise and suggest for anybody who wants to kind of at least take a look at how can you handle your money a little more efficiently or more successfully to, to go and take a look. And well, then, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So with that being said, we always have two questions for every guest at the end uh, that I also want to ask you, Eric. The first one is, if you could meet anybody, who would it be and why? Meet anybody, who would it be and why? Um, you know, I'm not one to hold people, you know, like up on a pedestal too much. <laughs> um, okay. But I, yeah, if I could meet anybody, who would it be? It would probably be something really silly. Like it'd be a sport. It'd be a sports person. Like I would love to meet Phil Mickelson or Tiger Woods or so. Because that'd be like a you know cop kind of awe inspiring. So no, that's not very exciting. That's not a great answer. But it would be it'd be well, a sports no, person. There is no there is no judgment. Are you into golf? I do like golf. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that would make sense to to hear a little bit how one of these professional golfers sticks, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah, just be it'd be amazing because the, they're so much better than I am, and so that'd be kind of awe inspiring to just understand. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing when you do this when you're on your own with your buddies, but doing this under the microscope of the world, I I wonder how they do that, how they can actually get themselves into that kind of state. Okay, yeah. So what's the first question? The second and last question that we always ask is: If you had a time machine, you could go anywhere you wanted to obviously can't change the space-time continuum like they say in Star Trek. But where would you go and why? Yeah, I um, I think it's tempting to say, you know, you'd go to the future, um, but I would go, go to the past and I would go, um, I would go to a time before plastic. Okay. And I would go to a time before cell phones because I don't, I can't imagine a world without those two things. And I just think it'd be so interesting to be like, how, how in the world did we buy food? How did we get stuff? Like, it just, it seems like a simpler time. Uh, and I would like to experience that for, for a bit. Yeah. But it's actually not that far back. I grew up during that time. Yeah, I know it's, it's right before I was born. So that's, I think that's why. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously I'm a little older than you. And so, yeah, no, I remember this and it was different for sure. The one thing that is blowing my mind on a daily basis is how much everything has sped up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in those more typical things, right? Like at the time when there were no cell phones, no email, no none of that stuff, you interacted with somebody in a professional engagement, even let's say over the phone, and then it took a week or 10 days until the piece of paper arrived. 
weeks. <laughs> right. Right. And and then you read it, and if you didn't agree to it, even if it was supposed to be a form to sign or stuff, you called them up and said it's wrong, and then you had to wait another week. That's yeah, it. that's crazy. You yeah. know, like think about that. And nowadays, if the email isn't there within 30 seconds, you say, "Why can you send it again? Something wrong with your server, or something like that." You know, so. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's why. I mean, I feel like even going 45 years, it would feel a completely different world. Oh yeah, and that was exactly. <laughs> All right. Wonderful, Eric. Well, thanks again for making the time. And like we said, go to Abando's website and uh, check it out and see what you can find and talk to Eric and get your money in order. Right. Thanks, Axel. All right. <laughs>